freshman year in Project Lead the Way, we learned a lot of um, basics about designing uh, solutions. And so we learned about the design process, which is something that we've been using all the years after that. We spent a lot of time modeling physical models, mathematical models, and also software models. And uh, the things that they're able to do at the end of the first year in modeling um, just amaze me. The Project Lead Away program really taught me a lot of mechanical skills along with electrical and programming, all the disciplines of engineering. Really it's, it's about creativity and kind of just having the ability or the willingness to work through ideas and to really get into things and examine what's going on, how does this work, can I make it better, how could I do that, and what are some great ideas that you know, that might help solve different problems of the world. We've also learned how to work together in groups and brainstorm, which is something that's really important to do, and especially in an engineering career in the future. It's helped me strengthen my thinking process so that I can go on to uh, college and to these uh, mechanical engineering field and be able to, right out of the gate, know how to think and know how to process things and know how to communicate to other people my ideas. It's just given me a head start in a lot of the disciplines of engineering that are taught like uh, mechanical, electrical and programming so going into the next step uh, I'll have a lot of background knowledge about those topics. I think having background knowledge coming into studying engineering it's like a big advantage. The lead up from the past three years to this year has been the most incredible journey because we've been able to take the curriculum from the past three years and use that to become very good at what we're doing this year. The highlight of the program for me is really this fourth year capstone course that I'm currently participating in uh, because we get to put all of the skills that we learned in the past three years to use in one final project uh, throughout the entire year. Being in this course is one of the best things academically that could happen to you. I think that the program has really helped me learn about different types of engineering and lots of different aspects of things that are um, very applicable to um, other mathematical and scientific fields. So you're going to use these tools now that you've acquired to then make more technical sketches. Again, they're not going to be perfect because these are brainstorming sketches. You're going to use these to move forward. PLTW has prepared me after Seneca, um, not only in like problem solving, which is a huge thing that we do here, but also in like time management. Being a Project Lead the Way teacher has helped to kind of broaden my world a little bit. It's it's let me look out into the bigger world and see where science, engineering, technology kind of all come together to solve bigger problems. Rather than just teaching them how to do something, uh, I find myself thinking about the inherent science and math concepts and trying to draw those out. I think that my highlight of the Project Lead the Way program is just how much it's taught me in terms of um, my future career. I've realized that I want to go into an engineering field because of this class. The things that we got to do in this class were so beyond what we would be able to do in like a regular drafting class or really any class you could have taken at Seneca because of like the resources that we have. I think they come out with uh, empowered to be engineers. Uh, they understand the fundamentals of what different engineers do and, and how to use those skills to make things happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Mrs. Heather Zanakis. Good evening. Thank you, and thank you for everyone coming out this evening. On behalf of our Lenape Regional High School Board of Education and District Administration, I would like to welcome several special people with us this evening and I would ask that you hold your applause until the end. Tonight with us we have our Board of Education member, Paula Lee. We also have Assistant Superintendent Matthew Webb, Principal at Lenape High School, Tony Catani, Supervisor of Science, Gene Jones, and our Project Lead the Way teachers, Zach Bross, Jim Scott, Mike Condorso. We also would like to thank our sponsors. 
Lockheed Martin BAE Systems and Instinct Graphics have generously donated. And we would also like to thank our partnership team, Robert Countess, Rich Jacobs, Dr. Medea Joffrey, Sue Ann Miller, Michael Pfeiffer, and Jill Zack. Now we can give them a round of applause. Thank you to all our sponsors. Tonight is a monumental occasion for these students as this is a culmination of four years of their journey together as one team and one cohort of students. They began this journey together four years ago as freshmen, probably not knowing exactly what they would encounter along the way. And here they are four years later and they're ready to show their friends and their family all that they've learned and demonstrate what they've learned and they've been working very hard this past year. So students, congratulations. We're excited to hear from you and see your designs in action tonight. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Condorso, Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Engineering, design, and development is the capstone course in the Project Lead the Way high school engineering program. It is an open-ended engineering research course in which students work individually or in teams to design and develop an original solution to a well-defined open-ended problem by applying the engineering design process. Students perform research to select, define, and justify a problem. After carefully defining the design requirements and creating multiple solution approaches, the students select an approach, create, and test their solution prototype. While process progressing through the engineering design process, students work closely with experts to hone their organizational, communication, and interpersonal skills, their creative and problem-solving abilities, and their understanding of the design process. Tonight, the students will present their original solution to an outside panel. Tonight's panel includes many of the engineers who have worked to support them throughout this year. Those engineers are Robert Countess, Rakesh Gupta, Dr. Medea Joffrey, Jillian Jamerson, Rachel Lachman, John McNamara, Michael Pfeiffer, Nick Roscoe, Jordan Stein, David Strahan, and Alex Whitney. In addition to those engineers, I'd also like to thank the technology education, math, and science teachers throughout the building uh, that are continually called upon to help with technical details. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome to the stage the first group presenting on noise cancellation, Haley Conway, Lucas Harsh, and Pranay Musamaladagu. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Our group's project is focused on the problem of noise cancellation. While there are many noise canceling headphones that resolve the issue of outside noise interference, they do not provide flexibility outside of the inbuilt hardware, meaning that the technology for noise cancellation is all on the headphones and not on the device. This can result in ineffective software or an uncomfortable listening experience for the user. So in order to best tackle our problem, we looked at prior solutions to the problem of noise cancellation listed here. And while we found that the Microsoft Surface headset pictured here best addressed the problem of noise cancellation out of the solutions we looked at, we found that it was limited in its customization with the soft noise cancellation itself. In addition, with it being a hardware solution, we found that it would not be very limited in scope compared to if the noise cancellation were software based and which, in theory, could be used across multiple earbuds or even across multiple platforms. So our main objectives included safety and legal issues in which our software had to abide by regulations regarding radio waves. And we also wanted to create a customizable, functional, and aesthetically pleasing software and user interface for the everyday music listener. 
So a little bit of justification on how we took the software approach. So at first, when we were doing some research, we initially considered hardware solutions. And actually, one of our prototypes was a hardware solution. The reason we actually shifted to a software solution is because of the flexibility that it gave us and how it addressed our problem. So we wanted to write our algorithm in Java, a programming language which is used on the Android platform. The reason we selected this platform is after a lot of consideration, we examined the scope of the problem and realized that us as students could only tackle a limited focus. So we realized that we had to develop this on Android, a platform that all of us are comfortable with and can code on, so that we can take this product forward in the future. And because of that, Android is a good platform as we can use the app on, say, tablets, computers, and phones, and then expand onto other platforms such as Apple in the future. So this is a sketch of our final prototype design. In order to best mimic the effects of our product on a user, we design a physical model of the year, which would then be connected to the software on a computer. And our plan was to have an ambient noise played in the room, which would then be heard by the microphone connected here to the model of the ear canal. And then the microphone would then detect how well our software solution canceled out the noise via the earbuds connected into the ear model. And then the results would be shown on the computer with our software installed. So on the left is a picture, well, it got a little cut off, but on the left is a picture of dental alginate, which we used to create a cast of Luke's ear. And we later filled it with silicone to create um, a replica of his ear for our testing purposes. And then in the middle on the right, you can see um, an inventor drawings of an apparatus that we would attach the ear to so that we can use it for testing. So here are two pictures of our finished ear model. The picture on the left is a picture of our finished ear. The ear was made out of rubber silicone, and it was a mold of the cast we made of my left ear. And then on the right, you can see the model of the ear canal, which was then connected to the microphone in the final prototype setup. So the picture in the middle here displays our final prototype setup. And on the left, you can see a picture of our prototype application. We'll explain later how we plan to make the application more user-friendly and cleaner to look at. But for now, this is the application that we use in our prototype testing. And then on the right is a decibel meter loaned to us by a teacher at Lenape. We use this to set a baseline ambient sound for when we were testing our solution. So we started with software development. And the way we started our development in general is we sort of split off into different groups, all wanting to analyze and utilize the best skills that we had. So for example, Luke and Haley started working on the documentation or the prototype model while I started work on the software. Because of this, there were some situations where I was designing software for an ear model that had not been completed yet. So this is just an example of some of the testing and the work that I did in the algorithm before I had the model. So this is just an example of three different algorithms for noise canceling. And the coefficient, or the number that you see at the bottom, is simply how fast the algorithm attempts to cancel out the sound. Now, even though the left is cut off a little bit, if you look in the center, those blue arrows sort of descend down into the center point and then stop, which means that they have effectively canceled out all the noise. Over here, on the right side, you can see that the arrows sort of begin to bounce around, which means that the filter is being applied too strongly, and the noise canceling is not effective. So this is an example of the testing at first, when I was feeding the algorithm sample data, just which I had randomly generated to be static that I found on the internet. So on the top is just a graph of the sound output, and on the bottom is the algorithm, with the red being what the algorithm attempted to correct, and the top blue being the sound. In this case, this is a case where the algorithm was not strong enough. And as you can see on the top, the sound pattern is sort of random, and it still shows signs that there was not cancellation being done. But in the next example, after my algorithm had been tra trained through several cycles, there are a lot more um, learned coefficients. All that means is that the algorithm had learned to cancel out the noise. And all those red dots indicate places where it had tried to effectively cancel out the sound. And as you can see in the top graph, it seems to be a lot more repressed, and the noise cancellation seems to work on the sample data. In the next few slides, we'll show how we actually took that sample data and applied it to the real al algorithm, which we tested on the actual ear model. So for our testing plan, once I had that ear model, I wanted to divide it into two categories, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative attempts to measure the actual physical differences between the sound levels. And this is all numerical data to make sure there's no bias. And we can actually say, OK, this is how much sound was there before and after, and how much less is it. And then qualitative is surveying a group of people such as yourselves. 
if it says that it cancels a certain amount of sound, but then we give it to users and say they don't notice a difference, then what's the point of the product? User input is always important to any product that any engineer creates. So we also wanted to include that within our testing process. So we just defined our variables that we wanted to test. The first for a quantitative was just the amount of sound reduced in decibels. That was pretty straightforward. But then the second term, cycles to noise reduction, all that means is how long it takes for the noise to dissipate. And then qualitative for user opinion, we asked users about both the comfort and the customizability of the software, two things that we specifically define, define in our problem statement as stuff we wanted to solve. So here's a graph. But on the left is the graph before the noise canceling, and on the right is afterwards. We took some of the advice from the engineers and students who came to our critical design review, and that we should try to narrow the scope of our problem. So this test simply showcased that, as a proof of concept, our idea works. So we tested it on one frequency, which was 20 kilohertz. So on the left, this was before the algorithm was applied. If you can see, at least that yellow graph is a little bit noisy. It doesn't look like a clear pattern, whereas on the right, it seems to be a nice circle. All that's saying is that the sound tone that we played through before the algorithm was applied was not clean, and it sounded messy as if the sound was bleeding in, which it was. And on the right is after the algorithm was applied, it effectively filtered out that extra sound. So for our qualitative setup for our testing, we did a random sample of 25 people listening to the song Hotel California. Our data was collected independently, meaning the people were surveyed independently of each other. And according to our calculations, the results were statistically significant, meaning that our software was effective in noise canceling. So just really quick to explain the testing process, the first thing I did when I asked those 25 people is make sure that they're not biased in any way. So the first question I asked them is, after playing them the same song twice, which I kept the same as Hotel California, I did not apply the algorithm and ask them if they could hear a difference between the two. This was just to make sure that there was no bias in any situation. And so 92% of people said they could not hear a difference, which was good, which means that we can move forward with the next test. The next test simply asked the people if they could hear a difference between the customizable version of the noise canceling and none at all. And once again, this was conclusive with 88% of people saying that they could hear a difference between the two versions. And then finally, we wanted the user's opinion, which is, did they prefer the second one over the first one? Now, this data is presented in a way that the second one was the noise-canceled version. We actually randomized those so that people would not know which was the changed version, so we could get a more fair answer. And in this case, 68% of people said that they preferred the noise-canceled version. So these are the results of our qualitative testing, which were achieved using a statistical test. We found that the noise cancellation software was successful in not only blocking out most of the outside sound, but also in improving the sound quality of music instead as if it were used on any regular noise cancellation device. However, the results of our statistical test also found that 15% of the people we surveyed did not enjoy the new noise cancellation software being used, so we would li like to work on that in the future. In addition, these are the results of our quantitative testing. And through our quantitative testing, we found that the noise cancellation software reduced outside noise by around 10 decibels. It's important to note that decibels are measured on a logarithmic scale. So a sound reduction of 10 decibels is a sound reduction of about half of the room noise, which was still very good level. However, we would like to improve it in future so that the software better cancels out noise and provides a better experience to the user. So currently, our software is only available for Android um, because we use Prenet's phone for testing. But we want to add a finalized user interface. As you saw before, our software interface isn't exactly as user friendly as we would wish it to be. We also um, hope to add support for larger devices such as tablets or for Apple devices on iOS. And we also hope to get Google Play verification and Spotify song integration, which would mean our software could run in the background and cancel noise while Spotify is playing songs. So this is just an example of what our future software prototype would look like. This is actually what we're working on now. We still have quite a bit of time until the end of the year. Even though it's a little bit, we still want to work on making our product as the best as we can. So even though we've proven that the algorithm works in its simplified state, we still want to bring this to more consumers, which means improving the interface. So this is just a screenshot of some of the work we've been doing in Android Studio to improve the look and feel of the application. 
So in conclusion, our software algorithm was a success based on the data that we collected. There's still a lot of work to be done. We obviously want our software um, user interface to be more friendly to users, and we hope that we can make it easier to use and that we can get Google Play store verification or possibly sell our software to a licensed audio company. And I just once again want to thank everyone to come out, for coming out today, and I also want to especially thank all the engineers and teachers and everyone who's helped us over the years to support us and bring us to where we are today. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. We just wanted to thank you very much for coming out tonight, whether that be the engineers, the administrators, the faculty that's working tonight, and also the parents, family, and friends. My name is Emma Watson. My name is Shavank Joshi. And I'm Trevor Montgomery. And our topic that we wanted to go into was the clothing management or the organization of clothing within the household and how to organize your closet better. So our problem starts with the fact that the average American spends about 15 minutes in the morning to choose their outfit for the day. And that's about 13 for men and 17 for women. And you can only imagine that this struggle would increase with people such as the elderly and those with disabilities such as colorblindness. And the frustration that comes with this struggle creates a social impact because what you wear is who you are and describes who you are for the day. And if you don't feel good with what you're wearing for the day, then that creates a very bad beginning of your day from the jump. So what some of our justification is for why we're going into this problem in this field in particular is the influence that fashion and clothing have in the world today. The fashion and clothing industry is a $2.4 trillion industry, so you can only imagine the amount of users and customers that would be available to this network and this field. So when we looked into different solutions that were similar to what we wanted to look into, such as an app that looked into clothing organization, we found many that were involved in fashion and clothing, but none of them really focused on how to organize the clothing that you already own, but they mostly focused on shopping for clothing that you don't already own. And also, let alone features such as location intelligence or services, weather or laundry appropriation. And also one thing we wanted to clarify before we want to get into our solution, we wanted to clarify that we know that this isn't a life or death situation that we're dealing with, nor is it an injury solving problem, but we also want to increase the convenience for our users and customers, and that's what's really important in this problem. So throughout our research, before we got started on solving the problem, we came across a series of apps and patents, including Stylebook, Smart Closet, Glam Outfit, and we wanted to see what they could do and what we wanted to improve upon. In these apps, many of them could not track where the clothing was in terms of if it's in the laundry, when it's been washed, when it's in the closet, and it could also not interact with the weather and what should you should wear for a given temperature. These apps also required that if they were going to select an outfit for you, you had to submit an in advance request and pay money for special outfit selection preferences. So our plan on how to combat this and create an easier daily routine for everyone in includes two steps. The first step is a smartphone app. The app views your whole closet and shows which clothing items you have and you can sort through them and view what you would like to wear for a given day. The second part includes an RFID scanner. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. This means that there will be tags that can be run by a scanner and it can register the location and can communicate where that item is. And so you can keep track of where your clothing items are, never losing them and always making sure you know when it's been washed. So the scanner can be mounted on a washing machine or a hamper or your closet and it is easy to see and use. The user can generate outfits on the app with the scanner and this will solve the problem in a multifaceted way. So our objectives are to have the RFID scanner as well as the app working seamlessly. However, one problem that we came across was that it's very complicated to interact through Bluetooth with the scanner communicating to the app so you can view everything on your app. So we made the decision to separate the two and work on the scanner as well as the app and save the integration for once both function completely without flaws. And this way we would make sure that the users get the best experience in the future. 
So diving into the physical prototyping of our solution, we wanted to talk about how the makeup is really it consists of in a SparkFun RFID scanner, a SparkFun serial to basic adapter, and a 3D printed ABS plastic container, which contains the system while it's mounted onto either a laundry hamper, a washer, or a dryer, so that the different RFID laundry tags can be scanned while the clothes are, clothes are passing through, so that the user can keep track of where their clothing is in the household. And we use the Universal Reader Assistant for the scanning process of our physical prototyping. But we had a little bit of difficulty with this at first, but in the end we were able to make some basic readings based on the different tags. So as Emma was saying before, we had some trouble connecting directly from our RFID scanner and the coding that we processed through that directly to the app. So we decided to divide the two softwares and create two separate tasks so that we could be more efficient and also possibly combine the end. And also elaborating on the physical prototyping of our solution, we wanted to make sure that... So the objective of our solution was to download the individual identifications of the laundry tags that we found and download them directly to the app from the scanner. But although we had some trouble with this, we wanted to elaborate on what the different RFID capabilities were based on the laundry tags. So. You can see that there are different varieties in the picture shown, or at least half of it. But, uh, so there are different RFID varieties based on laundry tags, and you can see that different pieces of clothing need different items based on durability. For something such as a sock, you may need something smaller, like the little black squares in the bottom right corner. Or you may need something longer and more flexible for something such as a sweatshirt, something heavy that's going into the washer or dryer, such as the long yellow strip at the top. And now we just show a demonstration of what our system would do when dealing with clothes going into the washer or dryer. So you can see our mounted RFID scanner on the washer. And just an example, you would be able to fit your entire laundry load into the washer or dryer to scan through. But this is just an example of one singular shirt. So you would scan over the scanner. It wouldn't just have to be one by one. It would be all at once. And the RFID would be able to scan them all at once. So for the second part of our app, or of our project, we have the phone application. Before we got into completely developing the code, we decided to work with an app developer called BuildFire. BuildFire allowed us to lay out our app visually without having the functions that the code would eventually have. So as you can see, we have six options on our menu, including choosing an outfit, viewing your closet, the weather, whether, where your laundry status is, the settings, and contact us. These options will allow the user to do a, very, a variety of different things with their clothing and be able to view everything the way that they should. This is an example of what one menu would look like. In the My Closet page, you, you can see that you can view your bottoms, your tops, and one-piece outfits. This separates all of, the app, all of the clothing items into categories that are easy to use and, um, and the user can find what they want to find. For the tops, you can see that you can scroll across the page and different, sh of your, different ones of your shirts will come up and you will be able to pick the best outfit for you. I'll be talking a little bit about our results, especially on the software side. So some criteria we used for testing were the scanner's functionality, the app's capability, and the app's compatibility with different softwares like different Android uh, devices. And we rated these on a scale of one to five. So we wanted our application, especially, to have code that could download onto any mainstream Android device. And we did this using Android Studio, which was, it is a software that would allow this to happen. And we also wanted it to be able to generate those random outfits that we talked about earlier. And this is where we drew the line for our application up to this point. So the main page of our app is set up as shown in the screenshot here. The two buttons on the app would allow the user to input their own closet and access the clothes. The two on the bottom are just settings and contact us buttons. And the button in the middle is for randomizing the outfit, which leads to the main activity. So as you can see, as with the toolbar in the bottom left picture, 
There's four tabs in this main activity, and I called them shirt, pants, style, and finally the check and submit screenshot that you see on the right of the screen. So the shirts and pants would let a user select shirts or pants that they wanted to wear that day, and the style would let them select between formal or casual, and finally the check and submit would be a final check before they submitted all their options chosen and got their randomized outfit. So this app and functionality and our overall functionality of the RFID scanner system and the integration had upsides and downsides. Uh, just the function of the RFID system we rated by testing um, with RFID scanning and we used 20, a sample of 20 tags and we saw how many of them were correctly read and on the first try and we got 18 out of 20 of them which gave it a rating of 4.5 out of 5 on our scale of 1 to 5 so we called this portion of our project successful and we were happy with that. Our Android application was partially successful because while the um, idea concept of the app and most of the software was present it could not integrate properly with the other parts of the project that we wanted to originally include in the app. And the integration and aesthetics of the app were also rated poorly and this was not successful because as we mentioned uh, we have a lot of work to do on the technical side of things to make sure that we can get the RFID scanner to integrate with our application and work seamlessly as we wanted to. So our group's goals going forward include getting the technical knowledge needed to make our desired goals happen and make that integration happen so that we can have an app that includes the laundry system as well as the random generation of outfits that we have currently. Thank you again for listening and we appreciate your time and those of us who came out to support the culmination of the past four years in the Project Lead the Way program, we appreciate your support very much. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Brandon Spitzer. And I'm Holly Ann Clements. And for our Project Lead the Way Engineering Design and Development Project, we work towards creating a streamlined grocery checkout. The problem that we were trying to solve is that in supermarkets across the United States, slow checkout is a major source of frustration for shoppers of all ages, and a reduction in the time spent waiting in line would increase customer satisfaction and throughput efficiency for the store. So to justify our problem, we conducted research and we found that the length of grocery lines was the least satisfactory aspect of grocery shopping when compared to 15 other factors. We also found that 18% of surveyed shoppers said that they would be prompted to shop somewhere else due to the length of the lines or their checkout experiences. And so here we have a map displaying some of the average grocery checkout times across the United States. Um, and so there we have for example, three minutes and seven seconds in Dallas, Texas. Um, in New York, it's three minutes and 34 seconds. And then taking the highest wait time for customers is Washington, D.C. at eight minutes and 23 seconds. And so we averaged all of these data points and some additional ones that aren't shown. And we found that across the United States, it takes an average of four minutes and five seconds for American shoppers to get through a grocery checkout line. In addition with our research, we looked at some existing products and patents. And the first patent that we were really inspired by is an RFID grocery bag. And we like this because customers can place their items in the bag as they shop. And then when they're finished with their shopping, there's no need to scan the items at a checkout lane. Um, but this isn't very effective because it needs a controller and a battery on board, which would make the bag very heavy um, and impractical, impractical for a customer to walk around a store with. And next is an existing product, which is the Amazon Go Store. And this is currently being tested um, across the nation in a few stores. And so we really like this because customers walk into the store, pick up whatever items they're interested in, and then when they walk out, it's charged right to their account. Um, but this uses a very complex and expensive system of cameras and sensors to track 
customers as they're in the store, so it won't be able to be widely implemented um, in an existing grocery store model. So before, before brainstorming, we created a list of design criteria and we ranked them based on importance. The first one that we have is performance and our design should effectively, sorry, effectively decrease the amount of time that shoppers are waiting in line at checkout as well as simultaneously scan the items. And the second one is shape and size. So our design must fit into the current checkout area and it should also meet customer needs by being easy to use by both the customer and the employee at the store. So for our solution, we selected to use radio frequency identification technology, which is shortened as RFID. And so this technology util utilizes radio waves to transmit data over a certain distance. And so this system consists of an RFID reader, which has a controller and an antenna, and then an RFID tag. And so the reader sends out a signal, it hits the tag, and then is sent back. And the controller on the RFID reader is able to interpret the information that's held within the tag. And so this would be effective because in a grocery store, when a customer gets to the checkout, um, you'll be able to use our design and just swipe it over all of your products and pick up what all of um, everything that's contained within a cart or basket at once, rather than having to individually barcode scan each item. So we're using this RFID technology and putting it into a wand. So once we chose our design, we began prototyping and incremental testing. So we use this software called Inventor to create a mock-up of our design. So as you can see, there's the wand and the shell that's going to hold the RFID components. And there's also an enlarged version of the wand handle to show the greater detail. The next step we took was creating a physical version of our model and we used a laser cutter to cut out the shell using foam and we used a 3D printer to create the wand handle so that we could create the intricate details. So regarding the RFID technology, the first reader that we worked with was the RFID Duino. Um, and so some things that we found out with it as we started to work with it was that it's a low frequency reader. Um, so those are the radio frequencies it operates over. They're just designated low frequency. Um, and with this, the read range was only about two inches, which was too low for the application we're trying to use it for. Ideally, we would want somewhere around two or two and a half feet so that when you wand over a grocery cart, it can get all of the items contained within it. And next, these low frequency tags were large and heavy, and so they couldn't be attached easily to items within a grocery store. But something good that we found out from working with this is that we can modify our code and specifically the delay rate between um, scans of a tag to help minimize duplicate scans of something and ensure that everything within a cart is still read as a wand is swiped over it. So with these things we found out from using the RFID Duino, we upgraded to the SparkFun Simultaneous RFID Tag Reader, which is shortened as SRTR. And so this is an ultra high frequency reader, meaning that the range with it is also improved. And with the antenna that's shown in the middle here, um, potentially this board could have a range of about one to two feet. And if we connect an external antenna, it could have up to a 16 foot range that we can lower by changing our code and the power that's supplied to the board. And over here are some ultra high frequency tags that we used. And so these tags are very small and they're also very thin. Some have adhesive backings and some don't depending on the specifications. And so these can easily be attached to existing products in a grocery store or even um, incorporated into the label that's printed right on all grocery items. And also these tags are, are a lot cheaper to produce in comparison to the low frequency tags. So it could be feasible to attach them to all items in grocery stores. And so in our RFID testing, um, we went through two different RFID readers, which was the RFID Duino and then the SRTR. Um, we tried three different types of connections, connecting directly to an Arduino board, um, using a universal reading assistant, which is an app on a computer where you connect it and then you can change different specifications on there. Um, and then finally, we used Arduino coding through a SparkFun breadboard. Um, and in this, we also attempted to use six different power sources of varying voltages and currents to try and optimize the performance 
performance of the RFID readers and their onboard or external antennas. So after development, we finalized our design and that consists of the SRTR antenna, the SparkFun breadboard, and an external power source, which is a wall outlet that gives off five volts and two amps of power. And as for the actual wand, we have the laser cut casing, which is cut out of acrylic and once again, the 3D printed handle. So after we finalized the design, we tested our design based on the criteria that we had mentioned before, but more specifically, we wanted to look at how well it scanned the tags, read and wrote them, its accuracy, and also the shape and size and the customer needs as well. So here's a list of all the criteria that we tested and as you can see, it effectively scanned the tags and, um, sorry, it scanned the tags, met the shape and size requirements and it also did not change the customer's experience very much. However, the read range was not as high as we would have liked and it was not as always accurate as it did not read every tag every time that we scanned it and unfortunately we were not able to test the time that it took to check out in comparison to the current method. Yeah and Holly just went through some of those but because it's cut off I'm going to read them off because these are our results and the things we found. Um, so pink is requirement wet, met, orange is partially met and then the mint color is not met and so moving from top to bottom we have scans tags, read range, writing tags, accuracy, time, shape and size, customer needs, and tag data. Um, and so if we had more time, and as Pranay said earlier, we have about two weeks left in our year to continue working on these, um, but if we had additional time, we wanna look into number one, printing tags. Um, so this could be applicable because we have the capabilities with our reader to write information into the tags, um, whether it be like a product EPC, so saying that something is oranges or different data about it. Um, and so we would want to try doing this very quickly and this could be apl applicable with printing a produce tag that you can stick right onto the bag and then can still be scanned by an RFID. Next is looking more into interference. In our testing, we found that when an RFID tag was attached to a metal or a metal foil item, um, it didn't scan. And so, and this is something we knew from our research, but we want to look into if there are ways to prevent or avoid this. And lastly, we want to look into locking tags. Again, with the RFID reader that we're using, we have the ability to put a password into a tag and lock it. So we can do this to help with accuracy, to prevent duplicate scans. And this could also be used as a security measure. If a tag were unscanned um, intentionally or if something were taken out of the store, this could alert the store manager that something is being, being taken out of the store. Also in working with this and as our product developed, we talked about some possible applications of it. And so of course the original intent um, and we hope it would still be ap applicable in a grocery store. Also possibly in an airport where you have a high volume of shoppers coming through that are only purchasing one or a few items at a time. This could scan those very quickly. And this could also be marketed as something that's trendy. Um, if RFID is like a new and upcoming technology, it could appeal to a younger demographic and bring them into grocery stores if they hear about this new, efficient, and also kind of cool way to check out. Um, and Holly and I both just want to take this opportunity to thank our professional engineer mentors, the Lenape administration, and the entire tech ed department department and especially uh, Mr. Mike Condorso, our, our teacher and everyone who helped us throughout the year get to this point that we are at right now. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. Hello, thank you all for coming out tonight. The topic we're going to be tackling is elderly phone alert system. I'm Jillian Williams. And I'm Matthew Cryer. Um, so um, as mentioned earlier, our topic is uh, um, falls in elderly and uh, senior citizens. Um, so one in three se uh, seniors 65 and older will suffer a fall annually, leading to 9,500 deaths every year. Uh, muscle cell breakdown begins after 30 to 60 minutes laying in an unsupported position. 
um, due to circulatory issues, and there's a host of other health consequences that can result in being trapped on the floor. Our goal is to prevent uh, being stuck in that position as uh, quickly as possible. In order for our design to work, we have to have an appropriate threshold to, occur, uh, to determine when an impact has occurred. We need to be able to communicate that moment of impact to a database um, or a software program to notify uh, someone, uh, to notify our caretaker of our, the user. And we need to have the ability to communicate uh, fall to our monitoring system, as mentioned. So how do we detect a fall? So as seen in the graph, with usual falls, there's a moment of the regular values, then weightlessness, and then the impact. And what we're here to determine is the impact. When an impact occurs, there's a jump in the data with the jolt seen here. And that's what we can find in our coding through the values. So what we've done to detect a fall is we have a three-axis accelerometer, and that's hooked up to a particle photon which just reads the values of it. And it determines the XYZ values every four seconds and reads the data and converts it in order to see the acceleration. So here is an example of the data with the XYZ values. And it just determines whatever the values are happening. So we detect, as said before, the large jolt in the data with the XYZ values. And that's what the threshold is for, is when it's passed from the previous value to the next value when it's big enough that it determines that a fall has happened. So um, the way we plan to alert people if a fall occurs that exceeds the, uh, or if we receive data that implies that a fall has occurred is by using a webhook to uh, communicate that data from the particle console where our uh, code is constantly checking for that threshold to be passed to uh, Twilio, which is a online SMS uh, message provider. So um, the main software component of our project is the particle console, which holds our code and um, is constantly uploading the information from our particle board and accelerometer to the internet. This, uh, when a fall is exceed, when this detects that a fall has exceeded the threshold, it sends an HTTP push to Twilio, which then um, prompts Twilio to send a message through an integration between Particle and Twilio. Um, we were also working on using ThinkSpeak, but we haven't quite gotten that to be fully functional yet, which would visualize the accelerometer data and give us a very useful model for our data. So our first version of a prototype was using the Arduino Uno and the ITG3200, which is our accelerometer. And as you can see here, it's hooked up via the breadboard and wired to the computer. And over there, that's cut off a little bit, is the serial monitor, which shows all the data values. And what's circled in red is a fall alert because the previous value and the next value exceeds our threshold of 4,500. So our next prototype is the ITG 3200 3 axis accelerometer hooked up to the particle photon. And it's also hooked up via the breadboard and wired to the computer, but it's just a different sort of software to determine when the fall has happened and to read the data values. So this is our code for the particle photon. Up top here is where the values are converted into values that we can see in the events log. And at the bottom is where it publishes it to the events log by saying that acceleration has occurred. And in this part of the code is where we actually see the fall alert. So it basically says that when the previous value is lower than the next value by a certain amount, which is our threshold, that it'll print out the diff exceeded or fall alert, depending on whatever we have it as in the code. And that will publish to the cloud. So um, for our testing, we, uh, we first had to start with our software, which um, we simulated falls to get the values that we could use to establish a threshold. Next, we had to uh, test, make sure that all the hardware components were working by testing the wiring and making sure we had a proper link between all of our physical components. Um, as we moved more towards our finished product, we uh, attached the accelerometer to our hip and actually simulated a full fall. 
Um, if that impact is detected, then we need to establish whether or not it is successfully sending that fall alert to the predetermined phone number. And here's just a video of our testing. That's the events log in the Particle Photon Console on the website. And it's not really clear, but you can see the variations in the size of the very left column is where it's the acceleration versus the dip exceeded where it says that a fall has occurred. Thank you for listening. Good evening, everyone. Today we're going to be discussing impact detection technology in football helmets. Hi, I'm Matthew Higgins. I'm Michael Mahar. I'm Pranav Thiravidi. So to get into our problem that we researched, concussion detection technology is not widely available in football helmets, making players vul vulnerable to re-entering a game with a concussion and further harming themselves. So obviously this is a large health concern. Uh, so a lot of our research was focused at the high school level, considering that the NFL does a lot of their own research and the high school uh, football level does not have as extensive of concussion research. Uh, so 67,000 are diagnosed uh, per year at the high school level with a concussion and 50 players have died from a concussion in football since 1997. So about one half of concussions go unreported or undetected, uh, which is really the problem that we focus on later on. And about one player in every game will obtain a concussion. So uh, looking at previous solutions in our research, uh, the solution that really sparked their interest the most was the Riddell Insight chip and it's basically a monitor that gives a uh, reading to either a trainer or a coach off the field uh, that a concussion causing hit has occurred uh, in a specific helmet. Uh, so we wanted to improve upon this design uh, firstly because of the design's cost. Uh, so for an 100 player program it's about $15,000 to install this for your team. And that's not considering um, if you have to buy new helmets for your team, if you don't have the Riddell helmets, because uh, the Riddell Insight chip is only compatible with Riddell helmets. And uh, this, the Riddell Insight chip does not consider uh, player size, height, and weight, uh, which can be a factor in how hard of a hit you can withstand. and. Uh, not have a concussion. So uh, the objectives of our project, uh, we wanted to have something that can, uh, a, a piece of hardware that can be installed into any type of helmet, not just the Riddell helmet, uh, that will uh, detect a concussion. Uh, we wanted the hardware obviously to have a comfortable encasing that would maintain the uh, protection of the pads within the helmet. Uh, we needed our design to be Bluetooth capable so that you didn't have to run wires from a player uh, you know, on the field to somewhere detecting off the field. And we also wanted to test for a range of values that can indicate uh, whether a player uh, has sustained a concussion or not depending on their height, uh, size, and weight. Uh, so next we look into our prototype design and construction. So to start off we used an Arduino Nano to program our entire um, software kit. We use the Arduino IDE and uh, C language to program it. And we were able to find data values using a triple axis accelerometer that can measure in like the X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, to get our initial numbers, we use the basic force equals mass times acceleration equation uh, to get those numbers. And on the right is uh, some pictures of our code. So our first prototype uh, what, that we did a while back, we started with the Arduino Uno uh, just to see if it would work or not. Then after that, we transitioned to the Arduino Nano. Uh, so like because um, an Arduino Uno is pretty big and that wouldn't fit well in a helmet, so a Nano is obviously much smaller. Um, then we did further testing uh, with a USB connection. And once that was all figured out, we went to a Bluetooth connection. As Matt said before, it's uh, impossible to put wires on them and while they're running around the field. So I handled um, 
an aspect of the project that was more hardware oriented in terms of what we were developing. I was developing a casing portion for uh, the different sensors that were going to go in the helmet. So I was already familiar with Inventor and CAD software, so I elected to use that to prototype some of, up, some of our initial designs, as you can see on the top left there. Um, we elected to use a TPU material because of its printability in our 3D printer and the fact that we already had it on hand in class, as well as it being a very flexible material that could be printed into a variety of shapes. So we did some testing with the material just to see how it would come out in the top right. Those are some of the material sheets. And then the bottom picture was one of our initial prints, which would actually be one of the, uh, the thing that would hold the sensors in place inside the helmet. So our first prototype continued. We were thinking initially we were going to have an insert that would be added to the helmet in addition to the padding that was currently in place. So we elected to use a flexible foam material that was going to be placed around the TPU printed um, design. So here we have the blown up picture of the initial prototype. As you can see, the TPU is in the middle with the Arduino Nano as well as the accelerometer placed inside that and the USB connection outside of it. Um, there was still development to do at this point because there was no way for us to hold a battery or um, the Bluetooth capable device, so we had more developing to do at that point. Uh, so after we got our first prototype done, we went into some preliminary testing. And we looked at, as I said before, the acceleration in the three different axes, the X, Y, and Z axes. And um, first, we got a table of values that were um, given like every second uh, by the accelerometer. And we were able to determine an impact by, seeing, like, by like, hitting the table, which releases an impact, and seeing whether it actually recorded or not. So on the next slide here is a table of values. Um, as you can see, if you just look at the x uh, axis to start with, um, all the values are in the 30s. And then after we hit the table, it jumped to 320, showing that there was an impact. And it's across the board that there is a change. So that means that uh, it was successful in uh, finding the impact. In terms of developing a threshold for actually what causes a concussion, we kind of struggled with this area a little bit because we're dealing with messy biological systems and not necessarily frictionless balls that are used in like physics class or physics examples. So it's hard to figure out exactly what g-force or what level of impact is going to cause a concussion. So in some of our earlier presentations we had talked about how the range of concussion causing hits could be anywhere from 50 g's to 200 g's and people would think wow that's a crazy number but it's because in football the sudden impact and the stop of the player as the result of the hit is causing this ele elevated g-force. Uh, so our, for our finalized prototype, uh, just to break it down, uh, there's really four main components. Uh, there's the accelerometer, uh, which is the square green thing in the bottom right photo. Uh, there's the Arduino Nano, which is the smaller uh, microprocessor that we were working with. There's the Bluetooth module, which uh, connected to Pranav's phone and read the uh, data of the accelerometer. And then there's also a um, onboard batteries so that um, you know all of the, the microprocessor and the sensors could uh, have power. So as we continued on developing our prototype we elected to go in a dip, sort of a different direction in that we weren't just going to be making an insert anymore but we thought why not make the pad uh, a replaceable pad for the helmets because TPU is already a material that is commonly used in aftermarket football pads that you can buy like on, on Dix or Amazon, wherever it may be. So we decided we're going to develop a pad that can be inserted inside the helmet in addition in replacing the, uh, the current existing pad. So once again, I used CAD um, Inventor software to come up with a design. Initially, we had it uh, designed and specified around a Riddell Speedflex helmet, which is the helmet that I used personally in my football career and that the school had um, on hand. But unfortunately, those have been out for um, sourcing and for, uh, what am I looking for? They're uh, re getting re-upped for the upcoming season, so we haven't had access to one of those. So anyway, we were able to get a Rawlings Impulse helmet in that we ordered off of eBay. And the design that we created for the Speedflex ended up working for that design helmet as well. So we were able to continue on with that and uh, develop this new padding system.
as you can see here, this is the developed vinyl pad that we uh, printed up out of the TPU material. That is the upside down version. As you can see, the wings on the side, those bend and allow for flex so that they can be placed properly inside of the helmet and not impede the user or restrict any of the other paddings from being in the proper positions. And that is the insert actually inside of the helmet. It's um, located directly at the top and the, the wings bend off to the side in order to ensure that the fit is proper. The lid actually prevents the sensors from coming into any sort of contact with the helmet itself. So in terms of testable parameters, some of the stuff that we wanted to test throughout the course of the project was the TP, P, TPU material printability. That was something we addressed right away and we found that the TPU was an effective material in terms of what we were doing, the scope of our project and the ease from the fact that it was already in our classroom and it was something we could easily use while in class. Wireless connection, we knew that we couldn't have a wire connected to the back of their helmet where they're running around attached to a wire. So we knew we had to develop some sort of wireless connection so that there could be a, a streamlined reading to a uh, off the field trainer or coach. The accelerometer Arduino connection, that's something we've had issues with uh, as of recently with our testing. The hardware casing fit, we wanted to make sure all those sensors could fit properly into the TPU printed pad. The unit fit in the helmet itself, as I said, we had printed it for a Riddell speed flex, but it ended up working for the Rawlings impulse as well, so that was checked off. The unit function and football related movements, so there was no uh, changing to the existing helmet where it would impede the user from wearing it comfortably and wearing it properly. Unit function, function and football related impacts, that's something that we want to continue to, uh, to look into as we develop a better accelerometer Arduino connection because we had the issues in testing there. As well as conditions testing, um, we wanted to be able to, uh, excuse me, we wanted to be able to uh, deal with all sorts of weather that it may face uh, in any sort of situation or football game. Uh, so as um, Matt was saying before, uh, one of the past solutions, uh, such as the Riddell inside chip, uh, one of its flaws was that um, there was no parameters that could be installed into it for every single player, because obviously every player is different. So what we wanted to do is some testing on the, our product itself, so, so, so we could create like a a uh, database of all the points and create a customizable parameter for every player. So this is our method for impact testing that we went on the field for. So first we would do uh, a walking test, which is a 10 yard walk, and we'd repeat that three times so we can get rid of any error. Uh, we would do that for jogging, sprinting, uh, and then we also went to a, co a collisions test where we would take a 10 pound weight and drop it on directly to the helmet. Uh, try to angle the helmet in three different directions so we could get like the points on the outside and see how that affects the accelerometer inside. Uh, we did face some issues towards the end of our season. Um, it, during the actual like building part time, uh, we, our accelerometers were working and uh, like the testing was like, like all good and everything. But after putting into the box and doing some preliminary testing, uh, the wires inside loosened and snapped actually. Uh, so preventing our accelerometer from working. So we weren't actually able to get a working model to show today. So, uh, and we actually were able to order a new one, but that's actually on the way right now, so. Uh, so our plan really is, we originally we, want, um, we wanted to be able to incorporate our design into any helmet. So we would develop uh, different CAD printable uh, drawings and inventor. Uh, that can be used for the different types of helmets that are used uh, in high school football. And we also wanted to create uh, custom ranges for any player. Uh, we began working on that until our accelerometer broke. So once we have that uh, situated again, uh, we'll continue collecting data for our, uh, for our customizable ranges. Uh, and we also uh, need to work on the, uh, extra, the charging of the battery. Um, Right now you have to take out the entire TPU casing in order to charge the battery and take out all of the electrical hardware as well. Uh, so we would work on a method of charging uh, the battery inside of the TPU encasing uh, without having to remove the entire apparatus. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, some things that we we're gonna do like after this, uh, after final design review is over obviously, would uh, be working on a, actual application to house the Bluetooth module inside so like we can uh, because right now we're using a third-party application
for Bluetooth. And uh, by using a third part, by using our own application, we'd be able to put everything together in one, give it to make it so it's ex easy to explain, and give it to uh, licensing partners. Because as as it stands, those values that you see, they wouldn't make sense necessarily to the average person. But when you factor in different equations and algorithms into the app that we would eventually develop, we'd be able to get like some sort of threshold of what is potentially a concussion causing impact or what's a dangerous impact for a player and what is not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for your time. I'd like to start off by sharing a personal story. This summer, I came home and opened the door to my kitchen, only to see clouds of billowing smoke. I quickly grabbed a fire extinguisher and put the fire out, only to discover that the source of the fire was simply a piece of toast that my sister had left in the toaster oven and had quickly grown into a fire. This event, while small, got me thinking. What if I didn't get home just then? What if the fire continued to spread? How much damage could it have done? So, Jason Jetter, Brian Boyle, and myself, Liam Anthony, decided to tackle the problem of unattended kitchen fires. In 2016 alone, over 166,000 American households were the victim of unattended kitchen fires. Considering how developed we are as a nation, this figure seemed absurd. Nevertheless, as we continued to delve further into these statistics, the true nature of the problem revealed, it, revealed itself. Fire departments across the country respond to, on average, 170,000 and 200 home structure fires due to cooking equipment every year, according to the National Fire Protection Agency. Home cook kitchen fires account for 40% of all home fires, 20% of home fire deaths, as well as 45% of all home fire injuries. And looking at the graph, you can see unattended equipment fires uh, result in a majority of uh, fires, civilian deaths, and civilian injuries in home kitchen fires. And beginning our research at the beginning of the year, we wanted to compare our ideas and thoughts or our future ideas against uh, solutions that have already been created or have been attempted to be made for these solutions. So we looked at things such as standard fire extinguishers or uh, a more specialized product such as stovetop fire stop or even uh, the AFO fireball. And we graded these products based on price, aesthetic, and function, along with other uh, factors that are listed along the top of our uh, table. And we concluded that none of these products uh, do as well of a job as we want uh, to be done. So starting off with our uh, design requirements, we wanted to first interview our stakeholders, more importantly, the target market. And from that, we determined that the four main functions that we wanted to include was, of course, the function of the device itself. We wanted to be sure that it could effectively extinguish a fire within a reasonable amount of time of the spread. We wanted it to be able to have a low cost so that the everyday consumer could purchase this product during mass production. We wanted it to have a good aesthetic rhythm with the rest of the kitchen appliances that were present and also autonomy. As uh, was said during the problem statement, um, most of these unattended kitchen equipment, well, the most of the fires were due to unattended kitchen equipment, so our device itself would have to work without any human interaction. So starting off building our prototype, we first wanted to start out with what we needed our design to include, which uh, was we needed a way to detect the fire. In the end, we used a thermal sensor. We wanted to be able to alert the homeowner of what was going on. To use this, we used a simple buzzer that would send an alarming sound. And we needed a way to squeeze a fire extinguisher handle to expel the repellent and shut, shut off the fire. So once we had our basics down with our test bed, we then started to think about what the final solution would look like and how we can make it clean so it would fit within our, in case, our casing that we would later design. So on the left, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a lot of lines going every which way. And that's basically all of our connections that we had to make 
so that our design would function the way we needed it to. And on the right is a nice and simple board that we would later cut out. We made our own printable circuit board, or PCB, and this basically would help us to reduce the amount of wires that we had in our design by making them all compact into one small space. So in this video that's going to be playing, hopefully, is going to show us testing how much force is required to squeeze a fire extinguisher handle. And from that data, we could find a fire extinguisher that we would, well, we could find a motor that we, we could use to successfully squeeze the fire extinguisher handle each time. So for our final design, on the left picture is again our final test bed with all the wires kind of jumbled in the background all over the place. And on the right here is our final control systems layout. On the top picture on the bottom left you see a little golden board. So that's actually our final printable circuit board that we made ourselves that keeps all of the wires in one small area. And that whole board is around four inches by two inches. In making uh, our product, we needed to have a sufficient casing that would fit everything we needed. Uh, so first, before to make any uh, permanent cuts or uses, we started with a cardboard box to find the correct dimensions to fit all of our electronics, our motors, as well as the fire extinguisher inside the box. And once we were able to find uh, the specific values of the length, width, and height, we were able to take galvanized steel, galvanized sheet steel, and cut and bend it into shape. And then we uh, secured it in place using rivets, and we left one side open to be able to look onto the insides to make sure everything's working during the testing phase. And we were able to also fit everything in, as seen on the photo on the right, uh, with our electronics on top, our fire extinguisher, and then the motor and spool on the, uh, the bottom left of that right image. So um, this is a quick overview of our testing procedure. Um, first, we lit a candle on fire and placed it in range of the uh, thermal sensor. Then we lit a candle. Uh, this represented a uh, this re represented a normal cooking fire. Uh, this would be normal activity within the kitchen. Um, then we placed a piece of paper on top of this and let it uh, begin to spread and ignite. And then we measured the amount of time that it took our device to respond. Um, however, the paper actually burns at a significantly lower temperature than the candle we were using, according to a study by The Ohio State University. So in order, to, in order to achieve this, we actually used a primitive, uh, primitive type of thermal imaging that detected the size, location, and temperature of the fire. Here's a full video of the test. So uh, as you can see, when the candle was first introduced to the device, it does not initially respond. And this would be someone you know, just lighting a fire and initially just cooking something on their stove. And the device successfully reads this as ordinary until the paper is introduced. Then, um, when it accurately detects that the size of the fire is increasing, almost immediately it extinguishes the fire. In fact, across all of our trials, uh, we had an average response rate of just 2.6 seconds. So going into uh, our final design, we had a few specific requirements. And the first one is it had to extinguish fire within 10 seconds of the spread from contained normal cooking fires to uncontained. And on average, uh, our design put out fires in 2.6 seconds. So it successfully put out all fires in uh, the test. And our next requirement was that it had to have little to no maintenance on a regular basis. And the only time our product needs uh, maintenance is when exchanging or changing out the fire extinguishers within the design, uh, similar to after it, the fire extinguisher has been used or after the fire extinguisher has run out of uh, extinguishers. The next requirement is that it must be less than $85 uh, during mass production because other products, uh, similar to the ones that we uh, talked about at the beginning of the presentation, are being sold for around $85. So uh, we calculated the cost of materials by adding up everything that we used throughout. And uh, our prototype amount came out to around $60. And finally, uh, to, uh, we wanted to identify and suppress fire with little or no human interaction. And due to this, we came up with a device that was a closed system 
while testing, which did not uh, need any human interaction at all. So our future goals are we want to even further increase efficiency of the internal components because we are able to do it in uh, a very good amount of time already, but there's always room for improvement and uh, just even a quick second could change uh, the course of an event. And then we also want to change the casing to uh, a more professional or more modern looking material that will be able to integrate into the kitchen and look more uh, in tune or sleek with the rest of the kitchen. And we also want to compact the project size if possible to better fit a modern kitchen setting because kitchens already have a lot of materials and a lot of equipment in them. And the smaller it is and the more compact, the better it will fit, as well as the more out of sight it will be. And it will be in the back of their mind just to know that they have something that can protect them if something were to go wrong within their kitchen. Thank you all for listening, and thank you for your time. <laughs> I would now like to introduce Mr. Joe DeJulius, the Supervisor of Technology Education at Lenape High School. Good evening. Let's have another round of applause for all the students, please. The faculty has examined the projects presented by the engineering design and development students and hereby certify that they are worthy of acceptance. At this time, it is my pleasure to present the Lenape High School Project Lead the Way class of 2019. Liam Anthony. <laughs> Brian Boyle. Holly Ann Clements. <laughs> Haley Conway. <laughs> Lucas Harsh. <laughs> Matthew Higgins. Jason Jetter. Shavank Joshi. Matthew Cryer. Michael Mahar. Trevor Montgomery. Pranay Musa Madugu, Brandon Spitzer, Pranav Thiravidi, Emma Watson, and Jillian Williams. <laughs> 